Hey, how's it going? What's up? It's Mark Aviglio, and you are listening to the Plains People Podcast for June 17th, 2018. If you're wondering what this is, it's going to be a podcast where I talk to people from the Fargo, North Dakota area about their stories. I think that, uh, that there's a lot of good stories, a lot of interesting people in this area, and I want to get them down on the podcast. So every Sunday, I hopefully will be uh, releasing these out. First one's going to be with Octavio Gomez. He runs the Taco Bros food truck. I'm pretty sure you guys have eaten tacos from him before, and if you haven't, you probably should because they're amazing tacos. So, uh, yeah, I think this conversation went pretty good. I sadly wasn't able to get him in the basement, which I hope to do with the other people. We had to do this over the phone, but even with that little hindrance, I think it was a pretty good conversation. So, hope you guys enjoy it, and here you go, Octavio Gomez. Okay, so, uh, you grew up in Fargo? Or around Fargo? I grew up in Muscatine, Iowa. It's all the way on the east side of Iowa. East side um, of Iowa? Yeah, kind of like where the river starts flowing from east to west. Oh, okay. Yeah, and no, I think I, I think I feel you. Yeah. Iowa's the one that looks like a nose, right? It's like yeah. a face with a nose? The man's wearing a top hat, and that's Minnesota. Yeah, Minnesota's a chef hat. I always thought of it as a, a chef with a Louisiana as the boot, and then uh, the Kentucky is a fried chicken on the Tennessee tray. So, exactly. <laughs> I was, looked at it, and it's just a happy accident that the fried chicken is is Kentucky. So you so. got at least six states right on the uh, history thing. Yeah, no, I can nail that, <laughs> but that's about it. I forget what state I'm in, because um, who cares about North Dakota even if you're in it? <laughs> yeah, they're just like geometrical shapes. Okay, so uh, when what brought you this direction towards North well, Dakota? And, uh... In about 1998, 99, my brother, who operates the High Plains Reader, um, they experienced a flood along with a fire. Uh, there was a Pulitzer Prize article about it. I think it was called Come Hell or High Water. Yeah. And um, they had their offices, which were located at the time in Grand Forks, uh, just burn and flood. Okay. So then uh, he needed to have uh, a whole new force of uh, salespeople and uh, I just kind of gave me a ring. I was like, what are you up to? And I was like, well, I just broke up with my girlfriend. So I'm just kind of like living in a city, you know, where I followed her off to college. Uh, just kind of uh, killing time until I can find a better thing to do with my time. Okay, that makes sense. So, yeah, you came up here just as a why the hell not. They needed help. You had nothing gluing you down there. Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, and that was about 1999? You said? Yeah, when you came down? that was probably like 98, That's funny. I came to Fargo from Brainerd in 98. That's like around the same time, right after the flood. I don't know why we flocked to an area that just got hit with a flood. It should be the other way around. But <laughs> <laughs> So with all these refugees coming in, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. So even with this... I'm not listening to the traffic signals. Yeah. Even with this place flooded, there's still more job opportunities you know, than anywhere else. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. So then, uh, fill in the gap, when did you start the taco truck then? Well, um, I worked a few odd jobs, kind of like in um, temp agencies, and then I found myself working at uh, Great Plains Software, which would then later be bought out by Microsoft. Oh. So I, I did that first in about 2008. Um, got let go from Microsoft. So it was a pretty good, decent paying job, good benefits and whatnot. So trying to find something to replace that is going to be a little difficult. But I managed to secure a position in, um, um, in, as a community organizer. So I did that for a few more years. And then the nonprofit organization where I was working. They lost their funding, and that's kind of like where, you know, everything hit the fan. I wasn't making the same amount of money yeah. anymore and not being able to procure the same amount of cash that I was accustomed to and my family was accustomed to uh, having. So yeah, I started that makes making sense. tamales, kind of like to make ends meet. Yeah. And selling them on Facebook. Built up a pretty good following of people, and I just like posted and let them know that tamales were available and 
Why tamales? Is, just be, huh? is it just because tamales are so easy to make in bulk? Well, they're easier to make in bulk. Yeah. They're, uh, they're, uh, they're not an easy type no, of No, they're not easy to, to make, make at all. Terrible. I wanted to make them, and I'm just not, I don't have the patience. I'm way too Italian for that. I just want to boil something and throw sauce on it. I can't, like, sit and make tamales. I get, yeah, that's, uh, I guess, the beauty of the tamale is that it's so labor-intensive. Yeah. You're willing to pay, you know premium price to have somebody yeah. else do it for you well exactly so, yeah uh, which is why i always order tamales from places because i love tamales but yeah i'm not gonna sit and make them i can make tacos at my house That's yeah easy. anybody can wrap something in half i think yeah you know, toss something in there taco. yeah i think the other taco stores in this area have proved that <laughs> 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 that no literally we can put like mcdonald's fries in here and call it a burrito <laughs> like oh yeah right. okay good job i find that fascinating what people will accept as a uh, as a definition of terms here when i got to north dakota yeah i went to a restaurant and uh i asked for a chili relleno and that literally translates to stuffed pepper yeah and they brought me a slab of the pepper that's commonly used in making it and it was it was uh, topped with a uh, you know a tomato sauce and and uh, queso fresco. And I was like, this thing's not even stuck. Just I'm just, do this. just sauce covered pepper. A sauce covered slab of pepper. Oh, this pepper yeah. wasn't even stuffed. Yeah, how authentic. Yeah. Oh, and I was just like, I was super offended because you know it's like uh, it's like you know having a, a request for something that is in the name. Yeah. And, um, and, and you don't get what was in the name. Yeah. Give it to you at all. It's like you know, a cheeseburger like, uh, and they bring you a hot dog. Like it, it's literally cheeseburger. What are you guys doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's literally uh, the words. Um, follow the instructions. They're in the name, you know? Yeah. You, know, you can ask somebody how to play Connect for but you're going to feel dumb after they tell you how. So here's the pepper. Can you go stuff it, please? <laughs> I feel like you guys are on the right track. Just finish the dish. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I, I get that a lot, of, especially if you're used to authentic uh, food of any culture. I'm used to Italian food because I grew up Italian, and I can't go to Italian restaurants unless they're really good because if I can taste, like, shitty canned Alfredo, I immediately am turned off. Like, oh God, it's not that hard to heat up Parmesan. Like, just make a sauce. It's not hard, so... So I bet that's the same if you go to a, a place that claims they make, you know, tacos and it's, it's you know, whatever, pork belly and cheddar cheese wrapped in a tortilla. And you're like, that's not a taco. It's just a pork belly. Right. right. It, it, it's disruptive for me to learn how to make a dish that I enjoy eating at other restaurants. It comes a point where, you know, I'm like, I'm like you know what? Uh, I'm going to see if I can make a Tuscan chicken. And then I'll make my own Tuscan chicken and I'll be like pleasantly surprised with my outcome. And then I can't eat Tuscan chicken at very many restaurants. Yeah. So I'm like, I, I, I'm not too critical, and I don't make a point of telling people, you know, I can make this better. Well, but the yeah. thing is, is you know, like the only thing that was stopping you from enjoying that meal was uh, any any more was the fact that you're not going to have to wash the dishes. Yeah. And if they take if they take that away from you, that you know you didn't enjoy the meal, but you just yeah. didn't have to wash dishes, well, then sometimes you're like, well, I would have rather washed the dishes than to have to put myself through that. Well, and I would rather spend, you know, the 30 minutes I did waiting on your meal, cooking the meal. Because I, uh-huh. you know, because I, I actually really enjoy cooking, too. So Especially if you have somebody that enjoys cooking with you. Yeah, yeah. Which, uh, I think my wife enjoys watching me cook. So that's mm-hmm. kind of the same. I don't think she likes my cooking that much. <laughs> well, as long as they're in, in the same, you know, vicinity and you're, you know, spending time together, I think that's, that's, a, that's a real big perk. Yeah. Or they're willing to get you the ingredients. Yeah. Sometimes they dice. Sometimes they just play nice. <laughs> sometimes they dice. Sometimes they play nice. Sometimes they watch Riverdale and tell you to sh- keep it down. Because <laughs> you're being too loud. <laughs> it's like, sorry, I'm only making your food. <laughs> That's what blenders do, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... So the idea to do... So it came from the tamales, the idea to do actual authentic Mexican food. Right. Well, so, in the in the process of making tamales, I ran into a fella that bought a dozen, and the next time he bought like you know two dozen, and then he was pretty much buying up the entire lot 
that I was making, and he was telling me, you know, he's like, you know, I go on sales calls, I do a lot of sales calls, and I bring these tamales along, and everyone's happy to see me, and I get to talk to people, I make more sales, it's been very productive for me, you know, you need to get yourself a restaurant, and at that time, you know, I was living from bill to bill, was, nobody was going to finance me. Oh, but, yeah. A restaurant, and I told him, yeah, people don't just give away restaurants to no. good tamale makers. And he's like, well, you know what? He's like, in the process of doing all these sales calls, I have run across some people that just have a food truck parked. So they should talk to them, see what they, you know, at this point, I didn't have really much anything to lose. Yeah. Plus, it was 2012, and the world was supposed to end on December 20th. Yeah, so you might like, as well. the time to take a risk. Yeah. I, remember, I remember that time when it was getting even a year or two out, because I follow movies a lot, and every movie I found out that was coming up after that, I was always, like, thinking in asterisks, like, man, I really hope I get to watch the next Avengers. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, at that time, because there was always, like, a just-in-case the Mayans or whatever predicted, yeah, which... Right. Yeah, yeah, Mayans, yeah. If, if somehow they were like, yeah, screw it, the world's gonna end, and no one gets to see Avengers 2. And at the time, I'm like, dang it. I really hope I get to, you know, see where the Marvel Cinematic Universe is going. Yeah, and I thought to myself, you know, if I'm going to make a, a fucked up financial decision, uh, <laughs> at least it's not going to, you know, cost me the next few years of my life so, at a high interest rate. So everyone else is panicking because the world's ending when it was supposed to, and you're just exhaling like, whoo! <laughs> ah, thank well, God it happened now. A, a, a ridiculous decision. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm out of all those bills, guys. <laughs> We're good. We'll let the world yeah, end. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, I went and talked to those people and they directed me to the person that I needed to be in contact with, wrote up a business proposal and got myself into a food truck. And then, uh, the rest, you know, the rest of the story kind of just goes from there. Yeah. And, uh, the first food truck got on the market, got a lot of publicity. Yeah. It was in 2012 when you started off, when the like, food truck came up? Yeah, I don't. I don't even remember when I. I don't think I came that quickly to it. I think I might have been a year or two later. Might have been. Um, if anyone remembers the first few days of Taco Bros, they were on the High Plains Reader parking lot because me and my brother went into it together. Hence the name Taco Brothers. Yeah. And um, we had a little spat over recipes and you know how things would uh, continue working on the food truck. And um, I took my. I took my. You know. A higher end share of the business and 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 took it elsewhere. So yeah, uh, a, a whole a whole three blocks away too. You really showed them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm gonna stand on this side of the sidewalk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, did he ever get mad to tell you to take the S off? Like it's Taco Bro now. <laughs> take right, the... right. Now we we were always doing business as Taco Bros, but yeah. uh, you know we. He did keep his logo. He had he had contributed a logo to the Taco Brothers food truck. Okay. And um, uh, that was kind of like his uh, his his in was being able to you know utilize the High Plains Reader newspaper yep. as a, as a publication that would promote the, the food truck, and then also his uh, capacity as a graphics designer to create logos and advertising for it. But uh, you know we 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 managed to procure eight hundred likes on our Facebook page within eight. Eight days, basically a hundred a day. But but did he sell a hundred tacos a day, or was it just trendy? It was uh, it was really quite the reception that we had here in Fargo. I think people were just dying to see what a taco truck was. They've probably been seeing you know the food truck wars on the food truck network, and the only things that they really have an experience with is you know during the street fair or the occasional events that they have at Island Park where, you know, you get to see some of these, you know, with the tacos yeah. or the, the, the hot dog vendors. When did, uh, when did Sweeto Burrito's food truck come up? Was that around the same time, or was that a little after you guys did? That was after us. Um, okay. We were, the first, we were the first, like, permanently situated food truck mm. in North, and not the North Dakota in general, but at least in uh, Fargo, North Dakota. Yeah. About... I would say no more than eight days later, Birdie's Italian Market came out on the scene. And, um, but prior to that, we got news coverage from Channel 11 News. Nice. Six, six days into the business, and then the next day, we got bombarded. And then, um, you know, regularly after that, anytime that we got media coverage, we were on the front page of the, the forum twice. Yeah. Yeah, all within the same year, you know, two spots on the news, 
two two front page articles in the in the forum. It was uh, it was daunting just how quickly you know the business was growing and then just being the singular one and only. Yeah, how many how many people were working in the food truck right away? Was it just you and like one person working till, or did you already have a couple people with you right away? Well, it was me and my brother at first, and then we recruited my uh, nephew. Yeah. And um, that was working out great. Then we needed, you know, more people and had a couple of buddies that were willing to step up to the plate. Yeah. And then um, my brother-in-law even jumped in a little bit here and there, helping out with um, sanitation. And then I found a few more folks. You know, everything just kind of, like, started falling into place. Nice. And... Um, yeah, it was, it was the people that surrounded me that were interested in seeing something, you know, uh, kind of like a Rocky Balboa making it yeah. like with, uh, with Apollo Creed. It's like people just supporting me all around the world. Yeah, of, of people wanting to see, yeah, somebody who clearly was in the same situation as a lot of other people of just trying to get a small business going. It, it's That's a lot more exhilarating to support and be part of than, like, if McDonald's all of a sudden threw together a food truck who cares? You know, they, they are too big to fail. You, you know, support the small. And also the food backed it up, I would say, is if you guys gave out, you know, Taco John's, no offense to fast food tacos, but if you gave out fast food taco level quality, you guys would have fell. It's the fact that you guys, it was good tacos I mean, on top I've, of it. Uh, I've always said, you know, to the food trucks that come and ask for advice or, you know, discuss, you know, their their intentions with me. They're like, you know, so what do you think would be good? And I was like, it doesn't matter what I think is good. It matters what you think is good. And yeah. if you have a constituency of people, you know, because before we started up Taco Bros, we talked to a few friends. We had a dinner party and then we had a taco cook off, you know, to decide, you know, what the flagship was going to be for yeah. the tacos. You know, and, and ease and speed. So everything came down to, you know, like, who's making the fastest taco? Who's putting it out on the table the fastest? And who's, you know, got the tastiest taco? Yeah. And then we'll go from there. Quality, speed, and efficiency. So you, you had a big taco cook-off? That's actually pretty it brilliant was, to figure yeah. out yeah, me techniques. and. and... Huh. That's yeah. pretty good. And, and, you know, we invited friends over, which were more than happy to be our, you know, guinea pigs. And oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we pumped out some pretty delicious tacos. And, and, and all that, you know, it was like, my brother was like, hey, I need some pico. And I was like, then you should have made some. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> was like, why, why? He was like, why can't you just let me have some of your pico? And I was like, because it's all about, you know, who puts, who plates it up first, bro. Man, it's like a cooking show. It's not like I'm over here, like, not trying to win this contest. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. I mean, we started probably butting heads probably even before we opened the food truck just didn't know it was going to come to a threshold. Well, that's the that's the thing. It's funny cuz I my my sister currently is running a restaurant with her husband out in Fort Ransom and I spent the weekend working with her and I had the realization because of siblings as you were saying with your brother is I butted heads with her right away and it, because I'm used to her being my sister, you know, so if she tells me what to do, I'll pick apart what she said and fire it back cuz but oh, yeah. then of course I had to realize She's not my sister right now. She's my boss, and I hated every boss I've had. <laughs> you know, that's normal. So just, you, what do you do when there's a normal boss? You just shut up and do what they said because they're the boss. And it took me about half the day before I was like, all right, stop firing back. Just let her berate you in front of customers and make the, make the food, you know, bring the food out. So I think, you know, is that where a lot of that came as you guys aren't used to being coworkers. You're used to being able to have that, you know, back and forth because you grew up doing that, you know. Well, yeah, we, we always challenged each other, yeah. you know. Uh, we always, like, you know, make, you know, cooking contests in the past or who could, you know, chop or dice onions better or smarter. Or, or faster, quicker. yeah. And when it came down to the business sector, it was like, okay, so you realize that you messed, you, you, you didn't win this challenge and it's going to happen like this, but, you know, then it came to the point where like, yeah, well, we did that last week. And I was like, no, we don't just challenge ourselves every time we work on the food truck together. That's just in stone now. Yeah. Like, no, 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 I want to make this. And I was like, well, you know, a lot about what restaurants are is um, consistency. So we had different views as well of how yeah. restaurants should run. 
Mm-hmm. You know, when he was on the food truck, he wanted to make beans with his, you know, ingredients. And I was like, nah, it's too late for that. You know, we've already started making beans. Well, like because this. if somebody likes your guys' beans and they come back and it's different beans, you might potentially completely lose that customer who was almost a regular. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, the consistency that was already laid out long ago with McDonald's discovering, you know, that it, it's just prudent to have every yeah. Big Mac take this, taste the same on every... Yeah, and literally, literally weigh the same, literally be the exact same burger. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's the same experience. You, I mean, like, if you're, if you're feeling nostalgia, if you're feeling yeah. homesick, and, and, you know, McDonald's seems to be the only thing you recognize while you're in yeah. Hong Kong, yeah. then that's, that might be the one thing that keeps you from crying yourself to sleep at night. Because, yeah, because you had, yeah, that makes sense. Wow, you almost made a Big Mac sound nice there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you you well, sold you that. You can't understand the language when you don't understand the culture and you just feel like, you know, this sore bunion on somebody's foot. And you, you don't want to be in a group anymore. I've seen people like that really lose it. I've gone on a, a few exchange trips yeah. with students and uh, they're so like homeschooled kind of a lifestyle and can't really assimilate into a, no, a new culture and have no interest in other people's existences that they would be able to take an interest in finding out what it's like mm-hmm. to try something new. Yeah. They, just, they just need to have their mommy and curl up with a, a book and a, and, a, and a bedtime story. It, and those are the people that suffer from, you know, these these, these horrible experiences from going to other countries. Yeah. The ones that, you know, end up flying home early is the ones that didn't get their McDonald's burger. Well, bec- well also, they, they reject the culture instead of try to enjoy the vacation by flourishing into this new experiences and yeah like i it drives me nuts i i went to virginia beach in high school with a friend of mine and we were like right on the ocean and it was the first time we've ever because we grew up around here first time we could ever get fresh seafood and we went to this place and i ordered like i ordered like a shrimp linguine and it was amazing you know like the shrimp had a different flavor i've ever had before you know because it was never frozen never anything and he ordered a blue cheeseburger i was like <laughs> Dude, it's gonna be the same blue burger anywhere. What are you doing? He's like, well, you yeah. know, I'm I'm not really a fish guy. I'm like, how do you know? You never had real fish. <laughs> like, try it out, you know. But I mean, like, I I will eat seafood if I'm at the sea. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a big oyster eater. Never have been because I don't go to the ocean that often. Yeah. But when I do, I'm gonna try all of the delicacies that I've heard are delicious, and that's basically what you just mentioned and it's proximity mm-hmm. to the freshness well yeah like even even weird stuff like when i lived in seattle for three years bananas had a completely different flavor and they were amazing and i would eat like two bananas a day and then i came back here and i had one and it had like no flavor i was like what what happened and then i i like tried and i i can't i'm not a banana guy anymore but when i was in seattle i was all the time and i don't know it's just proximity of where they get them or Whatever it is, I don't know. I'm not a banana expert, but uh, no, I mean, but freshness has so much to do with well, yeah. the business model. I mean, I've gone to these different conventions yep. where you know my vendors will say, "Hey, we're going to have this convention, and you're invited to go out. You should try it. They give you a whole bunch of free samples. You might be exposed to some product that you're willing to put on the food truck." I'm like, hey, I love it. So I go to their little convention, you know, and I check out their stuff. There's people that are making, you know, like pico and whatnot and i check it out and i try the pico and i'm like i can taste the preservatives in this yeah well yeah compared to that fresh yeah um that's another thing is my the restaurant my sister's running she's trying to not do anything frozen and she even's been making her ketchup from scratch and people will literally ask like for real ketchup I'm like, no, that's real ketchup. That's tomato ketchup from scratch. And they're like, yeah, but out of the bottle. I'm like, what makes you think that's more real? Because <laughs> like, people are so used to their very high preservative, you know, out of the can of everything that fresh food literally tastes off. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's one of the most disappointing things. Yeah. When somebody is so conditioned. Yeah, to it's microwave like, burritos. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, like, I when I got here, uh, and 98, 99, somebody took me to a, a restaurant, a local restaurant. Here, and they said, it's one of the most established restaurants in, 
in town. Uh, it's been around for over 30 years, and I was like, oh, that's great. And I get in there, and um, they, uh, you know, I, I, I ask for a simple dish, not, nothing too complex. And uh, they bring it out with corn tortillas, because that's what I requested, and the corn tortillas have little griddle marks on it. Huh. Which is completely ridiculous to me because who the fuck is cooking a corn tortilla on a griddle? Or is, is this yeah. just, you know like supposed to be like a, a cool little effect that they, they they add? Garnish it with a grill sake, mark, you know, for sake of looks. Yeah. And then I bend the tortilla, you know, like you're supposed to be able to bend a corn tortilla, and it snapped. It just like snapped in the middle, which means it's not properly cooked for one, and two, it, it, it's like a, a hard tortilla that you're not going to really enjoy eating whenever you put food into your mouth with that tortilla because it's going to be granulated. It, it, you're going to taste the granulation of the corn because of the fact that it's not properly cooked. And and then, I, then I'm like, you know, well, my first thing, whenever I go to a Mexican restaurant or, or anywhere, is I don't even bother with the entree. I, 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 will, I always go to the beans and rice first. Those are staples of Mexican cuisine. And, and if you can't get the beans and rice right, then get out of the business. Yeah, for real. And I, and I tried it out, and I was like, these beans taste like, you know, a fluffy composition of sawdust and cardboard. Yeah. And the rice was like any rice I've ever had at any Mexican restaurant that doesn't give a damn. Yeah. And it's like, a, I don't know, like a McCormick's, you know, blend of monosodium glutamate and some sprinkles that make it look like some kind of a fresh vegetable went in there, but it's just dry. Yeah, it's... it's... It's dried cardboard. It's, it's hazelnuts. So I was like, okay, so uh, I'm going to be cordial and friendly because this meal was bought for me. And yeah. I may even end up taking in and eating a, a portion of it, mostly just trying to smear it all over my plate so it doesn't look like, you know, I didn't try it. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the trick I did when I was five years old and didn't want to eat all my food. I like, stacked it to make it look like I ate half of it. Or hide it under a tortilla or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was gonna reel it back. So uh, were you when you grew up? Did your family constantly have authentic Mexican food? So that's why you and your brother had it constantly. Well, or? my parents are both from Mexico, okay. and my father always told us, you know, he's like, he's like, you know, in this household and in this in this area, you're no longer in America. As soon as you pass you pass that threshold, this is Mexico. Yeah. And so we never had American food. Wow. In the event that we had American food, it was because, you know, we, we'd gone out to eat. My father wasn't completely against going to McDonald's from time to time. And yeah. that would only be like on a Sunday, a special kind of an event kind of a thing. Yeah. And um, also he, he um, you know, was very adamant that uh, all of our food and all of our meals were, you know, Mexican cuisine. Yeah. And so my mom was a, my mom cooked, my father cooked, and we had to grow up eating, you know, Mexican food. So when I first went to, you know, grade school, mm -hmm. and I got beans, I was super excited because I recognized something on the tray. Yeah, but you didn't. <laughs> Everything else was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. You know, because we had tortillas, they had, you know, they, they didn't even toast the toast back then. And, and then the days where I was going to school, it was just a, it was just a white piece of bread with smeared butter. Ugh. I don't yeah. know if they still do that now. It like, probably is. Sense. It's Well, I think there are always, like, little buns now It's all the bread, at least from when I, like, 10 years ago was when I graduated high school, so at least then. But mm -hmm. I, and it, then when I, when I had the beans, I was like, oh, oh, is somebody done fucked up here? I mean, like, they mistaken the, the salt for the sugar. <laughs> I, I raised my hand and I told them, these beans are sweet. And they're like, they're baked beans. I was like, what's that? Baked beans. And I was like, well, they're, they're made sweet. And I was like, somebody done fucking put sugar into beans. <laughs> and of course, it would take a white person to do that. Yeah. Well, I didn't know this stuff. I mean, I, I was, I, I would have never thought that that was something that would have been, you know, even contemplated. Yeah, even nothing. even the idea of like, oh, maybe sugar in this. What? Why? <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> Why would you go and fuck up perfectly good, delicious protein by adding sugar to something that didn't need to be more of a carbohydrate than what it was. Yeah, jeez. Uh, so the American culture, you know, add sugar. Yep. Add, add sugar, and then uh, you know, as a last resort, add sugar. And then and then make fun of other cultures for putting in too much spice, but we use <laughs> sugar. Yeah. 
Um, Way more than any other culture. You no, know, I had the I had the same uh, uh, exa- uh, same experience with lasagna. I remember I in grade school I was excited for lasagna because my mom always made lasagna, and it was literally a big lasagna noodle wrapped around cottage cheese. It wasn't even ricotta. It was like cottage okay. cheese and then like tomato juice over it. And I was like, I can't even eat this. Like, this is a nuts. You know? <laughs> like, the idea of not thick tomato sauce weirded me out. If you, if your tomato sauce was not opaque, I was like, what'd you do to this? Why is it juicy? Did you water down marinara? <laughs> I was a kid, you know? Or, yeah, and then same with pizzas. I actually ended up originally hating the pizza because it was cut in a square and, like, you know, the pepperoni were all tiny, and it was like, what kind of Italian food? But, um... But yeah, so I remember that same thing. But I think everyone has that uh, experience with with public school food in oh, general. Uh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I, I think that uh, one of America's finest points, um, and th- that they have done with pretty much any cuisine, is find something that's exorbitantly popular in a different country and then just label it the same. Super, super Americanize it. Yeah. I walk through the aisles of the Mexican food aisle one day, and I come against these Hornell tamales <laughs> which are preserved in liquid yep with a i i, I want to say it's a piece of wax paper around them and i was just like what what the yeah. hell is going on here and i've always thought to myself you know like if i were ever you know like king of the world and i wanted to show america just how you know repugnant the the idea of what they do of finding some kind of popular American cuisine <laughs> and then just having it totally bastardized in another country, it would oh. probably be the grilled cheese sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd, I'd have like this grilled cheese mega store with like three floors, all this pizzazz and stuff, and people can come and order grilled cheese sandwiches, and I would give them quesadillas. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not even quesadillas, maybe just like a tortilla. And that's a taco. It's yeah. just a taco. Just a normal and taco. They would be like, wait a minute, we ordered grilled cheese sandwiches. And like, that's what they are here, brah. Then, that's how we do. And then just do a complete <laughs> language barrier just to piss them off even more. Like, no, this isn't a grilled cheese. Chicken sandwich? I'm like, no, wait, gr- no. Just to <laughs> anger them more. Right, right. You're south of the border, buddy. Webster doesn't have any hold here. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, we don't speak American in South America, quote unquote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my... sometimes people ask me how many languages I speak and I tell them five yeah I'll tell them I speak English yeah. Spanish American <laughs> Mexican and I've been working on my Canadian eh yeah exactly there you go <laughs> I uh I can talk in this neighborhood and in this neighborhood without getting <laughs> those two completely different languages yeah, uh, I have, I've had that all my life where people are like do you speak Mexican I was like no, I to make Mexican food. I don't think Mexicans speak Mexican. I'm pretty sure they speak Spanish, but who knows? Who's counting? <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> I think they did at one point. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, uh, what was I going to ask? Oh, yeah. So, if, if you don't mind me asking, I just had one, one question. So, with your brother, when you guys split, was there any bad blood, or was that just you guys are like, we'll go our separate way? toward my brother I still you know you're still you brothers know, same level of love and, and, and adoration for him we just had a really bad business dealing yeah and I was very upset with it I mean when we when we parted ways I was just like you know uh, you know my father and my sister hadn't spoken for 10 years but then she got thyroid cancer oh wow and I called my dad up one day and I said um, you know I just want to let you know that he's got cancer and uh, though it's a very treatable form of cancer, it's, you know, maybe maybe thought you might want to know. Mm-hmm. And so then he opened the channel of communication with her again, and uh, they started speaking. Yeah. So when when me and my brother had our fallout, you know, I was I was very upset. He was very upset. We couldn't see eye to eye. And uh, at the end of the whole scenario, I just said, you know, pray for cancer. And I didn't talk to him again for five years. Oh wow! Five so, years. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, that that was just a waste of time, honestly, because, you know, when we when we started talking again, we just let water be what it was under the bridge, and it, and it was what it was at that moment in time. Like, I, I kept the business, and um, I, I went on to, you know, create whatever Taco Bro 
Rose has come become today, you know, without any involvement of my brother. And he's, you know, continued along his path and, and done the things that he's been successful at uh, on his own path. But, you know, for five years, neither one of us shared any of our experiences with, with one another. And that's where the loss comes in. That's oh, yeah. Mean, like, did it need to be five years to heal the wound? Did, did, it, did it need to be five minutes? Yeah. yeah. Or did it, did it have to be anything? Could you guys just, you know, put your egos aside and realize you're still brothers? Yeah. Right. And that's... Yeah, you know, when he turned 40, he called me up. And I, I got the call uh, while I was at work. And, of course, I answered it right away. And I, I, I had no intentions of bringing up past, you know, uh, grievances because I missed the fuck out of my brother for five yeah. years. You don't want to. You don't want to immediately open that wound right yeah, away. Not even talk. It, there's just no point to it. No, we no. Know where we are now. Yeah. Everything that's happened has happened the way that things were going to progress. Either way, whether we were talking or not, you know, we, yeah. we were separated. All the business decisions for Taco Bros were coming from me. I don't tell him how to run his paper. He doesn't, you know, involve <laughs> himself in my in, in my business. You didn't. We we were we were going to be at the exact same place, but we were there without each other. Yeah, and that's that just awesome. why. Yeah, why? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I don't know. It, it always goes to that of of Are you gonna take anger? You know, with you, do, does anger mean anything? Those days where you're like, Are you gonna look back and be proud that you're mad at somebody for five years? You know, why would you be? You know, you got to be proud that you you're going to be proud that you opened it up again and you guys are friends again, you know, like, like no one's like oh, yeah. proud. Everyone was rooting for that scenario. I mean, like everyone that knew that we were no longer, you know, communicating. Cause me and my, me and my brother, we were like, you know, peas and carrots, you know, like, mm -hmm. like Jenny and Forrest Gump, anything that we were doing together, we were there communally and people just kind of got to the, uh, to the, you know, they, they became accustomed to having both personalities there, both of us there, you know. And uh, then one day it was taken from them. Yeah. And you know, they, they didn't. Nobody. Nobody said, "Hey, yo, you want to be on? Uh, you want to be on team team Octavia? You want to be on team Raul?" <laughs> but we were telling them, you know, like you, you need to be my friend or his friend because we both still cared for each other. We, we, yeah. we were just We were just mad. And they probably knew that too. Every, yeah, everyone who was close to you guys probably knew that too. That. Right. And all they wanted, all they wanted to see. I mean, like even like I don't know, Froggy. There was like a radio station that said, "You know, like, let's get the Taco Brothers talking to each other again." And was, <laughs> there was like this little like spurt of interest in trying to create a, I don't know, a bandage, some kind of a, a reunion. Yeah. But no, I mean, time. Time took its course, and the things that needed to process, and either one of us processed, and it's water under the bridge. It's not that's not something good. We need to uh, debrief on. It's not something we need to understand. You know what happened, why it happened. It's yeah. just like, what was the fucking point? Each one of us knows that that question is the most prevalent question. Yeah. What was the fucking point? And, like, let's just, you know, if we could make up for that for a lot of time, then let's fucking try to. But yeah. If we can't, then let's just pick up where we were before and we'll be, like, peas and carrots again. Yeah. No, that's that's probably the best way to go about it. Yeah. Uh, then on... Back to your, uh, your folks. Uh, I don't know if they're still around, but have they come up here and actually ate any of the taco bros or you know are they still uh, in the the you know picture and eat like have they seen how you brought up this uh this uh classical mexican dishes to all us weird white people up in the north right right well when i when i asked my father i mean like i asked my father for you know uh some cash to start this up because i didn't have anything and he was like yeah of leaving me some money when you when you pass away and uh you know you, you told me you were going to give me this house in mexico city which is, it, it, it's really going to do me very little service unless i ever plan on going and moving and living there yeah it's, I was like, it's a long commute looking, yeah like what i'm looking for and what my what my uh intentions would be you know i told him what i wanted to do and and he said 
do you, do you think this is something you can accomplish? He's like, do you, do you think this is something you can do? And I was like, I don't know. I'm not looking at it from the whether I can or can't. I'm looking at it from the, you kind of have to fucking do it. Yeah. You, it, you, you got to make this work. And if you don't make this work, then hope the world ends in 2012, December 20th. And, you know, you're out. Yeah. Everyone else is too. Yeah, then who cares? Yeah, no one's going to be all blowing up and like, man, I wish Taco Bros succeeded. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Nobody's Uh, going to have another chapter after that event. Yeah. Uh, And so I was like, um, this is what I, this is what I feel I can contribute. This is what I know that I have to be able to do. And I'm all in. I mean, this is, this is hokey pokey. I mean, I'm not, I'm not just putting my left arm in. I'm not just putting my right arm in. I'm not, just, you know, uh, uh, pretending that, you know, I'm just going to do a little dance. I'm, I'm all in. Yeah. I, I, I put your whole self in. I was like, I don't have anything else to dedicate my time to. I'm assembling bikes at Walmart, and there's really nothing else going on in my life that I need to dedicate time to other than the success of this business. Yeah. Uh, then a question on that. Are you... Uh... I mean, you guys have been a a food truck now for, what, five, six years now. Uh, I'm not going to do math. Seven years. Seven. Jeez. And that's that's a long time. I remember reading an article where it was from all these different people who had food trucks, and they were like, pretty much the point is, is to get a food truck and try to get a restaurant within a year because it doesn't sustain itself. And that's what the article (laughs) said. And I was like, well, apparently it's sustaining, Taco Bros is sustaining themselves. Because they've been going for a while as a food truck. But is the goal to continue in the food truck because it's working for you? Or are you guys actually, are you, are you, you know, have the foot in the, I'm trying to get a restaurant door at all? Well, honestly, I'm not much of a risk taker. I like to calculate things and uh, think that, you know, I've made a wise decision in accordance to the, uh, the, the things that I've decided to put into the, into the factory process. Mm. Now, of course, you know, getting a food truck and telling a guy that I'm going to be able to pay him back this much money or that much money within a certain time frame that was that was all a, that was all a program. You know, it was a I was I was a I was using a template from Microsoft Office, and it just said, you know, like how much would you charge for this, 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 and that, and I just put in numbers. It was like mad gabs, and it just produced a document for me. Yeah, and that's the document that I turned in. But in all reality, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to, you know, sell this many tamales in a month time frame. I'm like, this is just a, this is, and, and I'm pretty sure this is the same scenario for anyone out there that decides to do an entrepreneurial, you know, uh, launch. Yeah. They, they can't possibly know what their projections are going to be unless they've already been doing it as a subsect, like on internet or something like that. Once they decide to get a physical building, they're not going to actually know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, then I got, I got, I got one question because I have to ask because it's my favorite dish. So, who came up with the trust of just the idea that just somebody can walk up and be like, "Hey, man, whatever you want to throw in that that clamshell for seven fifty, I'll eat it." Who came up with that that trust platter? The trusty bro. The trusty bro was as a result of having to read the label off to drunk people and explain to them. What's going on? Well, that's so, probably why I like it. We, 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 we dealt with the one at the BAM at the bar closed, and probably about eight days into the business, we had explained the menu. I was like, so no, what? Just what? What's a tostada? And you like tell somebody what a tostada is. Oh, I just want a regular taco, and then like you know, well, this isn't where you're gonna be finding that. Yeah. Here's what we have: we have a flour, we have a corn. The corn is on a soft shell. We don't have a hard taco we have a tostada the tostada is flat you explain all of these things to people right i mean like you go through this whole spiel and at the end of it all they're like uh give me whatever you think bro i trust you bro once i heard that twice (laughs) you know what i don't have to explain all this shit if i just make it a menu item See, who needs like a like a brainstorming session around a table when you just have like drunk guys throwing out beautiful ideas? Trust yeah, you, bro. Exactly. Light bulb. Oh yeah, I mean the light bulb goes off all the time. I mean, like, so what's 
is that healthy for you? I mean, like, is that going to be? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get. I'm not. I'm not trying to say you're you're fattening me up, but I want to be a little bit healthier. So then we put the healthy, the, 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 the keep it healthy on the menu, and that's for the people that just want to, you know, a trusty bro. You yeah. don't want to have to think about their involvement and what they're putting in their body, but they just don't want it to be high caloric intake. Yeah. Which I think is a crime because I want as unhealthy as possible. It's the best tasting food, but um, that's just me. Right, and I, and I still won't do that to people. I still won't. I mean, like, I had fryers when I started this food truck. Yeah. And uh, I, I never even turned them on. Wow. I took them out. Uh, finally, uh, after three years, I took them out because they were just a waste of space. Yeah. Jeez. And I put in some prep tables back then. And I have never been happier. So what's the, it's funny because I've been there a hundred times, but you can't really see in where you got. So you got a little, do you got like a little flat, uh, flat top and then a, a spot for your saute pan, a little prep area. What all do you even got in that I little thing? Four burners. Okay. And then I have an 18 inch, um, flat top. Nice. I have four warmers for, um, uh, the, the meats. Yep. Yep, and then I have uh, two, uh, what are they called, induction ovens, where I keep the beans warm. Okay. And an oven. Yeah. Where I can hold things warm or, you know, cook up. That's where I make the al pastor. Okay. So, I mean, like, I've learned to use and utilize this space as best as possible, you know, for, it's basically the size of a jail cell. <laughs> it's, a, it's an 8 by 20 space, but it's also a lot of the space is consumed like what you would imagine. Your bed would take up would be like my three basin sink. And your toilet and your sink would probably be the uh, prep tables that I have in the back. But then you still have the oven and the warmers and the countertop taking up all that extra other space. And we're sharing this jail cell with like four other people. Yeah, you got, you got a lot of people in there. Yeah, and the difference is, I have sharp implements in that. I could shank a motherfucker. <laughs> so, right, right. Yeah. They don't let you have those on. They don't let you have those in jail. Yeah. So, I mean, like, you really have to be with the best people sharing this very minimal amount of space. Yeah. And if you can't have good camaraderie with the people that you are uh, choosing to share this space with, uh, yeah. I think shit would go down. I've I've worked on small lines before. Like I think Cajun Cafe had the smallest line where you're it, they put three people in a, an area that's big enough for one person. So literally you can't move your legs. You're stuck. And uh, I remember thinking how horrible that was. And then I looked at you guys and I was like, man, they got multiple people cooking. How is that a line? You got like this tiny little area. Like, you must be on each other's toes when things are busy. But. Oh, God. And, and, and that's just part of the learning experience. Yeah. I'm glad, that, I'm glad that, you know, we've never done any advertising. We've never gone and tried to, like, you know, be, like, at the forefront of everyone's, uh, you know, external, um, where, where, where people populate your mind with ideas. Mm-hmm. We're just uh, we're just on the tip of people's taste buds, and, you know, yeah. the tip of their tongues. Once we've had, once we've had an experience with Taco Bros, then you know their taste buds belong to us, and and the taste buds are on the tongue, so we control that. Yeah, and they they're the ones that drive business towards us. But mm-hmm. It's a, it's a gradual growth. It's something that's calculable. When I was having the news media do like uh, spots on us, or the radio, or the newspapers. Uh, do front page ads and the next day you know you get 150 people you didn't know was coming did you prepare for it no and that's when people start getting disappointed yeah. uh, a person that just happens to be standing in line on a Wednesday you know and has been a regular and then sees that many people are like oh oh, they're going to be extra busy but a person that's never been to Taco Bros and uh, is waiting in line for an hour yeah literally an hour I've like done it get for a Wednesday taco you know, it's yeah. the same time ago. We don't put pixie dust on the days that we're really heavy. We don't have any. Yeah. They're still going to have the same experience, and, and it's not going to be as revered as they put it in their mind. It's still a taco. Yeah. It, like, it no- may be a better taco than you've had in the past. It may be a better. But after you've spent, you know, 
an hour waiting beside a railroad track in downtown Fargo behind it's the still Empire Tavern. Four it, minutes on the lips. Yeah. 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 It's. It, I mean, like, I, I can't express to people even like the fact that you know, like, our opening day is uh, it trends on Twitter or it's you Facebook. know like one of the most you know retweeted things or liked things on well, Facebook. Yeah, I don't even have don't Twitter, even... and I get like six texts when you guys open by six different friends spreading the word. And then I'll tell my wife, and she either already went and did it or is already planning on doing it for lunch because she finds out right away too. So it's weird how your guys' opening day, like, because no one knows when it's coming, you give like a little teaser, I think, and then all of a sudden it's... it's midnight. We, have, we announce on midnight, and I don't even know if that's a good idea anymore <laughs> because all we said is this is the message you're waiting for. Yeah. Get it. Well... It stinks because if other restaurants know a big day's coming, like a Valentine's Day or a Mother's Day, they can do something because they have a, a full-on building. They can, you know, like, bring in extra people. But you guys, no matter what, have that same little... Diminishing return. Yeah, you, same little crew. Anything. Yeah. So, as much as I love doing it on those that opening day, I skipped it this year because I was like, I'll wait for tomorrow. It's going to take half the time. You know, <laughs> like... It's, well, the first year, the, the, the last year we had one in, one hour waits probably for two weeks. This year we've had one hour waits for an entire month. Geez. And at this rate, at this rate, I'm wondering, you know, like what what's on the horizon? I mean, I I have to have now. I mean, like unlike other years, now I have someone that runs um, the, the the runs for my pickups for food. Because I just simply do not have time to prep and also go pick up the merchandise. And a lot of people don't realize, you know, like, we are just a little food truck with standard refrigerators, well, standard industrial refrigerators. The sizes of these refrigerators are putting out as much food as one of these restaurants down here that's brick and mortar and has a walk-in cooler. Yeah, the size of a, like, a room, yeah. Right, we we don't have that, and and there's there's no hope that we can. I mean, like there's there's no way we're gonna be able to widen that that food truck, no. or make the fridges any bigger for the space that's allowable inside of there. So well, we have to have we have to have double runs during our heavy season, and escalating and being able to make sure that these things fall into play and yeah. all the different other factors that make it possible for people to like stand in line for an hour and then not be told that we're sold out because that's the most disappointing thing in my mind is that you've been waiting for an hour and a half yeah to be told that you're sold out i think that if somebody tells you they sold out of food then they didn't inventory properly yeah because i mean like that's what you're there to do right you're there to feed the you're, you're, yeah you're there to sell food you're not there to put people on that picnic table you know <laughs> you're there the yeah. yeah uh so is there is there any thought of like opening up a second one that's like right next to it that you can just like, just to double up what you can make or any thought like that? That was <laughs> my. The only one that I'd be comfortable with. I'm a horrible businessman. That was my. Yeah, I'm I'm a horrible businessman. That was the best thing I can come up with. Just another trailer. Yeah, so, see, like so so I mean like I I I've contemplated the idea of like opening up another one, right? Yeah. But then I've also thought about the idea that, like, I can't be there simultaneously. Yeah, that's true. And, and the, the fact of the matter is, is I wouldn't leave a seven-year-old alone in a pool of 150 people. Mm -hmm. And that's that's all I can think of. I mean, like, if I've had people that have been with me, and I do, I do have people that have been with me pretty much since, you know, my son, Rafa... He's, uh, he, he started calling for me when I first started. I, I sent him to the corner of Broadway and uh, Second Street and said, you know, just yell out tacos, tamales, tostadas, brand new food truck opening up in front of the High Plains Reader parking lot. I just gave him the whole spiel. It's like, just, you just call this out. You tell people to come down here. He was so interested in being a part of the whole scenario Yeah. that, that he was happy to do so. I did get three customers. You know, so there's this really cute little 10-year-old screaming out <laughs> into the corner. He's been with me since 2012. Nice. Since he was 10. 
I yeah. didn't let him start working on the food truck until two years later. This kid was operated in the food truck, you know. Yeah. As a teenager, and he knows all the ins and outs, the recipes, the temperatures, how to, you know, uh, make every different kind of meat. And, and these aren't, you know, like McCormick packets. Yeah. You know, really he's got to be able to, he's got to be able to put the right amount of five different kinds of peppers in the beef alone. Mm-hmm. So uh, he's got to be able to put these things together in a specific way and know what the taste is. You know, like he'll check with me every once in a while because he doesn't like avocados and he makes me taste his guac. But I'm hoping that someday he'll be like any other Mexican on the planet <laughs> and eat avocado because it's very <laughs> disruptive in my life and my son. Yeah. It's I'm a, not a fan of avocado. It's, it's like, like Italian, not like in tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> There's certain things you can't say you don't like as a Mexican, son. <laughs> Cor- <laughs> corn and guacamole. Yeah. Hey, guacamole. Don't say you don't like beans unless they put sugar in them. <laughs> that was a that was a callback, folks. That's a, that, that's a callback. That's what we call in the industry. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I, I told Rafa, I was like, you know, when when you decide to go off to college or something, you know, you're you're basically talking about a restaurant that maintains a 4.7 rating on Facebook for the last seven years with over 4,000 likes. I was like, you're talking about, you know, a, an establishment that has a, an excellent rapport and you should be able to demand an excellent salary for wherever you go to work. And I was like, and don't let anybody tell you when you're driven just because it you're wet a- behind the ears because you're a little guy. Like, yeah. You've been managing people. Yeah. I was like, I, I, I may not be able to do much for you in life, but I did give you a trade. Yep. And you may not want to be a taco vendor when you grow up, but it can put you through college. I always I always think of being a cook as a, as a curse and a blessing because I worked in restaurants growing up too. And now I have a work ethic of go, 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 go. But I'm at a factory where it's literally unsafe to move as fast as you can. But in the restaurant, you have to. There's literally a time called The Rush, where you move as fast as your body can go. But if you do that in the factory, people are yelling at you. Like, slow down. It's unsafe. But uh, but at the same time, yeah, so you, you get that. But it's, 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 I think it's a curse just because kitchen, if, especially if you enjoy it, it's like a, it's a, like masochistic of just wanting to just torture yourself in this really hard labor. <laughs> like... That's that's just how I think of it. Is like if you enjoy being a cook, it's literally you enjoy one of the the hardest, most stressful things. It's so crazy. <laughs> it is indeed. I mean, I have uh, often thought to myself, you know, like, how difficult it is to take a siesta between the breaks because I work from eleven to three for the lunch and then six to ten for the dinner. But being able to come down from a lunch rush. And the adrenaline flow, and then just trying to maintain, you know, all of these like mental uh, cues, you know, like oh, we're gonna need to make more rice. We've got about forty minutes of rice, you know, at the standard rate, and we need to get another beans running in the bag. We need to have some more corn put down. We're gonna be running out of beef. We need twenty more minutes worth of beef. Yeah, and, you know, like I'm gonna have to make some chicken somewhere between this shift. And we need to get some <laughs> kind of store running. All of these things that are rushing through your mind. At the same time, you're pumping out, you know, one minute and 45 second orders because that's kind of like what I hold my uh, people to. I was like, they're, they're, they'll people that'll come to the one and I said, how long is the wait? And I said, just tell them two minutes per ticket because that's a pretty fair standard. Yeah. But but we'll get we'll get tickets out in under a minute and 45 on a typical basis. But I say always shoot for two just in case we get that. Crazy person that decides to order six Mexi dogs because those are all with raw bacon around them. That's gonna yeah, take a while. It takes a while. Uh, I got a couple more questions and then I'm gonna end this. Uh, first one is so uh, you got a kid? Have you been married this whole time during all this? No, no. I was uh, after uh, my uh, departure with Microsoft. You know, I don't know that it had anything to do with it. Probably just you know difficulties in, in, in married life in general, but. I, I separated from my wife at the time. Yeah. And then I have been remarried again. And, um, you know, that lasted a few seasons of Taco Time. <laughs> uh, you know, 
it, 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 this business really requires a lot, a lot, a lot of time for me. Oh, I, yeah. I'm about 97 hours a week. Yeah, geez. So, I mean, like, if, if it was a woman, she'd probably be like, I need my space. I need yeah. my time. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> no, I'm... I'm married and I have a couple hobbies, but I couldn't imagine running. Like, you don't work 40 hours. You work way more. I couldn't imagine just trying to pitch that, like, hey, we'll see each other for five minutes before we go to sleep and I'll be really tired. <laughs> That's it. Like, right, right, right. No, I have 97 hours a week. I, uh, I have very little time to be able to partake in normal life. Any other aspects of life. So, so the beauty of it is is that, you know, my children work with me on my food truck. So you get to see them at least. So I get to see them. I mean, it's a, if it was all a family enterprise, then we would be able to be with each other during, you know, the entire time frame that things take place. And it's in a, it, it's in a fun environment. I would venture to say that the people that work for me, the people that are like there during um, taco time, which is what I call it, um, uh, I'm more than pleased. I mean, like, I have no problem recruiting people, and I work at a sorority house during the off season. Yeah. So I mean, like, there's there's a group of 22 girls that clean up and do um, maintenance in the kitchen after I've cooked for them. That sounds like an awesome job too. Just well, the cool. Well, yeah, a sorority house. 22 girls. I mean, like it, it. It sounds like the beginnings of a. Uh, yeah, uh, one of those one of those movies with the funky music. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so I mean, like uh, the the cool part about it is that you know it's like a vetting process too. You know, you, you see how well they do. Yeah. You can actually, you can actually you know like look at you know their their work ethic and find out what they're made out of, and you know I will offer a job to these individuals at the end of a six month period and I've never had a, an issue with finding people that are like willing to work on top of those it's been it's been an excellent relationship for me yeah and I think you know the fact that I'm trying to learn other dishes and how to cook Tuscan chicken and beef wellington and, oh yeah uh, like, wellington know, uh, recipes from other restaurants I tell them to send me a video format um, the recipes that they would like me to cook, and then I just pick amongst the ones that look the healthiest and the most, you know, desirable. Yeah. And I make them. So when you're at the sorority house, do you still keep with pretty much like Mexican food, or do you? Is that the time where you can branch out and try yeah, a bunch of different uh, stuff? Brother, you got it, brother. You, you hit the nail on the head. Boom. I don't have any intentions of cooking taco bros while I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> People want to put me in the brick. People want to put me in the brick and mortar, and they do. Yeah. They want me to be twenty four seven. Then I need to learn how to make appetizers, yep. entrees. Um, I also need to make soups, salads, infused waters, things that are going to make people want to come to a restaurant that's not just a conversion from food on a paper plate to food in a porcelain plate. Yeah. I, I, I strongly feel that if you try to make that conversion, you're going to find yourself in the seat of sweet burrito, you know, where yeah. you decided that you were going to try and serve french fries mixed with beef in a burrito and think that that was going to carry you. Well, and a, and a lot of that like, comes with expectations is any food truck, your expectations are different than if you were in a sit-down restaurant, Period. Just because exactly. of the nature of it being in a food truck. So the fact that you rock out these amazing foods, like there, that's what makes it so, you know, prevalent. Hey, it's a food truck. It's just a couple guys, but they're putting out great, authentic Mexican food. And then if you, but if I walk into a fancy restaurant, you're going to be right on the money for a fancy restaurant. So you have to, you know, crank that up again, you know, or else, yeah, the sweet burrito situation is you can't give out you know, food truck quality food, which yours is already above that, but food truck quality food in a, you know, downtown restaurant. Yeah. I I understand that from the perspective of like, you know, knowing other business owners downtown and knowing the quality and the capacity that they have as, uh, as chefs, as cooks and as, you know, artisans, because it's one thing to just be like a really good chef. 
And then it's another thing to be able to put it on a plate and present it and make it look like art. Yeah. Now, if you can do that on a piece of paper plate, <laughs> then you're knocking it all over the in place. A, in a clamshell, yeah. You don't have to do any work for yourself. People are going to do that work for you. Yeah. But in the downtown genre, at this time frame, I have had the understanding that business drops as soon as the weather gets nice because everybody's going somewhere else with their yep. water. That's what's going, that goes, that's exactly this area is, is weekends during fall and spring are always better than weekends during summer because no one's around. Because they're all going to the, the very mysterious lake. I'm not sure which lake, but everyone's like, I'm at the lake. Dude, there's a, literally 10,000. Which, yeah. which, which one? It's on the license plate. Just read it. Yeah, just, which lake? Like, the lake? I know one day I'm going to be driving by, like, like Brainerd, Minnesota, and just see a big sign that says the lake, and everyone I know is going to be there, and I'm going to blow my mind. <laughs> this is the lake. I've been looking for this place. <laughs> yeah, it's real. Just my friends from elementary school who haven't grown up, weirdly. Um, but anyways, uh, I got I got a question that I'm pretty sure is your most frequently asked question ever because I have to Google it, even though I've been going there for years. So what are your guys' hours? <laughs> That you're open? What are your guys' hours? I've been told that these hours are weird and strange. They are. Sorry, but they are. Started, and then probably around season six, season seven, I was told these, these hours are brilliant. And well, well you conditioned us. Same genre. We're, we, it's like Stockholm now, where, where we think it's good now because we've been doing it for so long. We're... Well, it, it's the Pavlovian type of a scenario as well. I mean, like, if you hear the bell... You're going to come. And uh, we, we open from 11 to 3 for the lunch. Yeah. And then, you know, from the time that I was open, I, I started my first year, I was from 11 to 11. <laughs> and then I just started logging what time frames were. Where everyone's the there. And that's, and, yeah. And, you know, from that, is where I, I decided that, you know, I, I needed to be closed from three to six. Well, yeah, you're, it's, you don't have a, a second shift. You're not there for lunch and then somebody else's does a switch like every other restaurant. You're there every single rush. You're gonna need to not even take a break, but just restock clean, you know, this normal stuff other restaurants get to do. Restock clean and prep. <laughs> yeah, and, and re-prep. Like, you're not going to, it's it's literally, you wouldn't be able to prep everything for a 12-hour work schedule at the morning and fit it all in there. You have to no, take a break. Even to, if there's, like, three people that come in between there and just order two tacos, they're still going to take two minutes away from you from doing the other thing that you were doing that yeah. you might have to put on hold, and then you might have to bring to the right temperature just to get started on it again. And that's, that's, that's essentially my reasoning behind it. So I'm open from 11 to 3 for the lunch, 6 to 10 for the dinner. I may be stocking things in between, or I may be taking a siesta in my vehicle. Yeah, why not? One of them is going to produce better tacos for you. If I'm sleeping, and you just feel the need to come and say, hey, yo, your tacos are the best, but you woke me up, I may not be the receptive person that you thought I may be. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do. I just take a nap in the parking lot. Turn on the air conditioning well, and uh, just try to relax. I mean, and on Fridays and Saturdays, you know, for the bar crowd, one to three a.m. Yeah, yeah. Which is, I almost, I almost went last night, but, uh, but I didn't. So sorry. <laughs> I just no, not, not a problem. I know. I, I wanted to get home. I only had two beers, and that's another thing. Is I can't wait in that line if I'm sober. You know. Is <laughs> is everybody else is gonna be getting in my nerves at one thirty or two? there if I've only had two beers. So and it's the craziest crowd. It's oh, the it's craziest, nuts. most adoring crowd of fanatics that I could ever hope for. I mean I I can't say enough to stress the idea that, you know, like Taco Bros uh, fan base is a cult uh, in, in a weird food cult kind of a way. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Just as long as you don't all of a sudden bring Kool Aid on the menu, we're we're fine. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Last day, it's free Kool Aid. Oh no, he went full <laughs> cult. Uh, Tiny little four ounce containers. All right, I think uh, I think this is pretty good conversation, and it was awesome. I think we're gonna end it. 
So well, thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you for. Uh, 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 one one last thing for everyone who isn't a cult member. So you guys are behind uh, Empire Downtown, right? The Empire Tavern. That's right. Downtown Fargo. We're located on Robert Street, right by the railroad tracks. You can't miss it once you. Uh, Find the railroad and Robert. And then you guys put something in those tacos where you think about them the next day, so you really well, don't miss it. There's some people that don't call the Mexicorn by its uh, yeah. by its name on the label. Uh, they just come up to the window and they say, "Can I get some crack corn?" Yeah, that that's about right. Well, uh, the funny thing is, I got Mexicorn on a trust like two years ago, and I I order Mexicorn now outside my trust every time, and. <laughs> I've, I'm not even kidding. I've had fights with my wife over Mexicorn. That is not a joke. Is we've gotten it, and then she'll eat the whole thing. I'm like, what'd you do? That was for us to share. She's like, share? I'm like, what the heck? Like, I didn't order just Mexicorn for you, so now we literally, she'll order a Big Mike. I'll do a trust. We'll order two things of Mexicorn because we can't share it. There's a Horrible. guy in here told me, and he lives right next door in this like blue mark building. He said that his cat will attack him <laughs> if he does not give him Mexicorn immediately upon entering the apartment. <laughs> he will just grab his ankles and he will drop his food and he'll have Mexicorn. Yeah. So he knows better. Jeez. <laughs> the cat needs crack. Just he's got it, he's got it, I know it. <laughs> That is some scary stuff, man. That's some zombie stuff. It, it's, it's weird. It's weird. <laughs> the, the more stories I hear, the more like I'm just like, uh, I don't know if I need to know about this yeah. anymore. I'm you like, know it's just are, food, guys. What the hell? These are people that are going outside of the, uh, uh, out of the cult regulations. <laughs> <laughs> they start to idolize. <laughs> yep. Well... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it. This is really awesome talk, and I can't wait to get tacos sometime this week. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate the call. Yeah, you have a good one, man. You too, bro. Well, there you go, guys. That was our talk with Octavio, or my talk with Octavio, or our talk, if you were listening, right? Because we're a collective. I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. Uh, anyways... There you guys go. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed him talking about beans for that long. And I sure did. So if you guys haven't gone and eat tacos from him, go eat some tacos. I hope you guys are ready to uh, listen to our next one next week. It's going to be with Bill Lucas, uh, who's taught at uh, Ben Franklin and Fargo for a lot of years. And then now he you'll see him around doing uh, stage plays. So I got to talk to him. I'm really excited to share that uh interview with him and i was excited to share this one with you guys too so you guys have a good one be good people let's do another one all right i need to go to out i just stole one from dead meat <clears throat> be good people's dead meats um don't kill anyone um are there any good like superhero catchphrases you could use maximum effort should, should i use Good night think, and good luck. <laughs> no, I I think it Keep should be one a, in the chamber and one eye open. No, I think I think you should. I should just use random ass catchphrases at the end and switch it up like what Kevin Smith does. Okay. But he he tries to make it about the conversation, but I'm not gonna do it. Uh, what would be a really good one? Uh, and you just decide out of the fucking blue. Sorry. Uh, I want to be like, and I always check the barrel. Just like an iced tea B movie. And remember, no stairway. <laughs> no stairway denied. You guys have a good night. Hulk smash. Uh, Excelsior. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, Always give maximum effort. Yeah, maximum effort. Uh, the one that Leslie listens to, the, uh, the My Favorite Murderer podcast, ends with stay safe, don't get murdered. <laughs> Which is fucking awesome. Keep one in the chamber and one I open is a favorite of mine. Where where is that from? I don't know. I just heard it a long time ago. Uh, um, one of my favorite. Watch pod- out for your cornhole, bud. <laughs> 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 uh, did Bob and Doug McKenzie have one? Cool, 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 cool. Oh, okay. Uh, no, I don't remember what the uh, 
what the ending is mm. of them. One of my favorites is Razor Fist, and he always says, God fucking speed. <laughs> um, you know, I'll probably just end it with, I, I think I'll know what I'll do. I'll, it's going to be a, a lame one, but I like it. It makes me happy. Okay. Uh, all right. All right, there you guys go. That was our, my talk with Octavio Gomez, and uh, it was a pretty good one. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We mostly talked about beans, but whatever, man. Beans are good. I like beans. They're the magical fruit. Next week, we'll be talking to Bill Lucas. Bill Lucas has been teaching at Fargo Public Schools for a lot of years, and ever since he's been retired, you probably uh, have seen him or you'll see him around town doing different stage plays. Really cool conversation. We dug into a lot of stuff. We actually got him down in the basement. It didn't have to be over the phone like this one with Octavio. So I'm really excited to share that one with you guys next week, just like I was excited to share this conversation with you guys this week. So yeah, if you haven't gotten a hit up Taco Bros, go do it. Good tacos. And yeah, there you go. May the force be with you, and I'll see you fuckers later.